Welcome to your first Japan lecture. Um, if you've noticed, we haven't really discussed Japan yet. There's several reasons for that. First off, Japan developed into um, organized government systems way later than everywhere else. There's several reasons for that. Japan is a island of volcanic rock. They lack natural resources. They lack availability of a large food surplus. And when you don't have that food surplus, you're not going to have a large population growth, which means you don't really need big government. Um, what really leads Japan to even organizing at all is the threat of China, of China coming into the island. So it really takes outside forces for Japan to centralize into any type of government system, where elsewhere it was really about population numbers. So that's a huge difference between Japan and everywhere else that we've studied. Now Japan from this point forward is going to be unbelievably important. Now if you notice on this slide, the time period that we're going to be talking about for Japan is from 600 to 1750. So we're including you know, three time periods in this one lecture. But again, the reason for that is because Japan just really wasn't significant until this time period, until we get into the 1750 era. And obviously they're going to be a force to be reckoned with because we end up with, you know, World War II. So as we go through, um, please take notes of the time period that we're in um, and some major comparisons from Japan to other areas, um, especially in regards to their slower development. The key concepts um, first mention Japan when we're talking about 4.1. Um, what they want you to do here is they want you to, to understand woodblock printing. So even the first the College Board, the, even the first time that the College Board even wants you to know about Japan is when it comes to the arts. And Japanese art is very unique because of its isolation. And we will talk about some of that later in the lecture. You can see here also that um, we have new social and political classes that develop in Japan during this time period. And those political classes are really based off of this daimyo. The daimyo are just like the nobles in Europe. So they're the upper class, they're the lords of the feudal system. And the daimyo are going to run the show for quite a long time. Um, and eventually we're going to have a couple of emperors who manage, not really emperors actually, Japan has a very unique government system. Um, they're going to have some people who manage to organize those nobles, just like we saw um, in Europe with like Louis the Fourteenth or Henry the Eighth. Um, you have to deal with these upper class old elites somehow. And um, Peter the Great was really good at it. Louis the Fourteenth was really good at it. And we have a couple Japanese guys who are also very good at it. Um, as far as state consolidation, one of the things that the Japanese are going to do is they use urban planning and courtly literature to kind of show how they're in charge. Um, like I said, the Japanese government system is very, very unique. They have um, two separate systems. They have an emperorship and then they have another government system that's actually running the show. So it can get complex when we're talking about Japan. But the idea of using a capital city or using um, literature to especially in the post-printing press era, to show, hey, I'm in charge. And the Japanese are going to do that as well. So when we're talking about early Japan, basically what ended up happening was an aristocratic family, a family of nobles said, we're in charge. They um, organized everybody and they managed to basically convince everyone in Japan that they were the ones who could orchestrate protection from China. Now what the, these aristocratic families did that they used from China is they're going to use all of the same Tang policies in regards to government structure. They develop a bureaucracy, they develop a system that's very Chinese in its nature. Um, they have a, a court system, uh, meaning that they have not court like judge jury court, but they have a, a noble system with just like with Henry VIII where you have you know, the aristocrats fighting for favor from the king and things like that. Uh, of course, they have the bureaucracy that they stole from the Tang, the idea of the bureaucracy. In regards to land control, they create a system called the equal field system. Ideal, ideal, ideologically, uh, the Japanese are going to import both Confucianism and Buddhism in their philosophies and in their religion. However, the Japanese at their base religion is Shinto, and Shinto manages to survive and kind of uh, synchronize into Confucianist and Buddhist beliefs 
They set a capital city at Nara, and like I said, they do keep Shinto. They just add Confucianism and Buddhism into their daily practice. One of the things that the Japanese really liked from Buddhism was the idea of meditation. Um, you can see that in th with the... Um, the samurai and um, their training and some of the other different cultural tendencies that the Japanese have, they're based off of what's called Zen Buddhism. And Zen Buddhism is a Japanese, is unique to Japan, and it is associated with meditation more than anything else that comes from Buddhism. So out of that, we get what's called the Heian period. Basically, the emperor, the aristocratic family that set themselves up in the previous time period, moved the capital to the city of Heian, which is why we called it the Heian period. Um, and the emperor wasn't really in charge. He was a figurehead. He didn't actually rule anything. Um, this is so unique that I can't even really create a comparison for you. The, the emperor was an ideal for the Japanese people, for the peasant class, for, um, you know, there's an upper class in Japan and a lower class in Japan. There's not a middle class because there's not merchants. Um, they aren't trading with anyone, so there's no merchants. So you have the nobility, the aristocrats, and then you have the peasants. Well, for the peasants, they needed this idea of the emperor. Um, the emperor in Shintoism does somewhat correlate to a godlike figure um, in the sense that the emperor was a father figure. Um, the emperor wasn't necessarily in charge of treaties or declaring war or anything like that, but the emperor was necessary for the peasants to feel stability um, from the government system that was in place. Um, the family that was in charge was the Fujiwara family. And the Fujiwara family is just like any other royal family, like the Romanovs, like the um, Tudors. They were just running the show um, alongside this kind of um, idyllic emperorship that was happening. Um, the power, the political power was in the hands of the Fujiwara, and the emperor was actually protected in this capital city as this ideal. Um, and the Fujiwara family and the emperors like never really interacted. It's not like they did anything together. The Fujiwara family just kind of ran the show, but the peasants didn't even realize that was happening. The peasants knew the emperor. The peasants knew this idyllic figurehead. Um, so again, Japan's really unique in its systems. One of the most important literary forms, that, things that ever come out of Japan is the tale of Genji. The only reason why we know about the emperor and what was going on in that household was because of this book written by a woman. Um, she was a lady in waiting at the court with the emperor, um, and she basically told the story about um, this leading figure, um, this male figure, and this male figure would have relationships with everyone in the palace and it and the writer basically was describing all the different roles in the palace what different people did what the social classes were and things like that it's kind of very similar to what Chaucer did with the Canterbury Tales um, and she it reads very much like a soap opera um, it it is very much meant to be for entertainment purposes however um, we as, as historians have taken this to be truth. We have taken this to be an inside look into what it was like in that Heian capital, in that palace. Um, and basically he, the main character, um, goes through these trials and all these kinds of stuff, kinds of things that, um, and with different, he has love relationships and he has affairs and um, he's kind of a Casanova figure, like he could get any lady that he wanted. Um, that's a huge leading um, part of the plot to the story. Um, and Taylor Genji really gives us this huge insight into the imperial court. The biggest problem with the Fujiwara system is that the equal field system fell apart. The equal field system is the idea that every family would get an equal amount of land. 
So, but the problem is, is that now that they're getting a little bit of stability and their population numbers were going, were growing, it was becoming a little bit more difficult for that equal field system to stay in place. If you're going to have an increase in population, then obviously the fields cannot remain equal. Um, there would have to be some type of governing body constantly redrawing borders and redrawing lines. So the equal field system is eventually going to collapse. So you end up with two clans, the Tierra and the Minamoto clan, who end up with the most land. So basically, they ended up with the most kids at some point, and they managed to kind of get the most land out of this equal field system. And of course, they started fighting, and the Minamoto clan won. The Minamoto clan is going to create what's called the Shogun system. So keep in mind that the emperor in Japan is always there. Not really doing anything, but always there. Always an ideal figurehead. But we have a new system, once Minamoto clan takes over, called the Shogun system. So now you have two things going on. You have the Shogun, who's actually running the show, who's actually the kind of king figure, who's actually the government guy. And then you have this imperial court in place. And um, the Minamoto clan is going to create a new capital city where the emperor now is not even going to be isolated from government affairs completely. So we enter what's, what's called medieval Japan, which lasted from 1185 to 1543. And this was a feudal system, just like what we had in Europe. You have the, the um, samurai were your knights, um, you have your daimyo who were your lords, and then of course you have the highest lord, which in European culture we called the king, um, and in Japan we call the shogun. So they were very militaristic. Um, each of the provincial lord, each daimyo, would have their own military. We called those military, those knights, the samurai. Um, the samurai were a um, were family. They were the samurai um, culture was passed down from generation to generation, and those generations were always going to be loyal to the same lord. Um, and the samurai were provided for by the lord. The samurai didn't because the samurai focused on their art of um, fighting and uh, sword making and things like that, the samurai never did anything in regards to meeting their own basic needs. The lord would make sure that the samurai were protected, or were taken care of in regards to basic needs, and in return the samurai would protect the lord. That's just like the feudal system in Europe, or, and again, the lords in Japan are called daimyo. What is, um, that's important to understand because one of the biggest changes for Japan is, is when the daimyo lose power and that in in turn is going to cause some serious problems for the samurai so please keep that in mind as we go through japan our first um, non-medieval emperor is called tokugawa iesu the tokugawa um, please remember that in asian names the surname comes first so the last name is first so iesu is his first name and tokugawa is just the dynasty or the clan name Tokugawa Ieyasu basically um, was a was running the show, and he restructures the government and finds a way to end the feudal system, much like what um, Henry Tudor did, or what Louis the Fourteenth does. And one of the ways to do that is to control the daimyo. Well, what he does is he creates this massive military government where he has such a large amount of samurais that the provincial daimyo's samurais no longer matter. Um, he creates kind of a personal army um, and he's going to have to figure out how to deal with all of the other daimyo throughout Japan and the Tokugawa shoguns were very successful in dealing with these other daimyo's. So we have Tokugawa shoguns officially from 1600 to 1868. So just to kind of give you perspective, um, the U.S. Civil War was in 1865, ended in 1864, 1865. So you can see that we're really getting into the modern era here for these Tokugawa rulers. Basically, what the Tokugawa shoguns wanted to do was avoid a civil war. This is something very similar to what was happening in Europe. In Europe, what ended all the fighting amongst the lords with the, was the Crusades. So when the Crusades started, all of the lords and their knights in shining armor would go off to the Middle East and just defeat the infidels, right? Except for when they um, sacked Constant Constantinople, which was a Christian city. But the idea was, instead of fighting each other, they were going to fight a common enemy. 
when you have a common enemy, it's really easy to rule a country. And so um, that's something that happened for Europe, and that's what helps with Louis the Fourteenth and Henry the Eighth and Peter the Great, and all that. Well, not really Peter the Great, but all those guys are going to be able to to centralize their governments and control these feudal lords because they create unity out of this common enemy idea. For the Tokugawa, they don't really have a common enemy. Nobody really cares about Japan. Nobody really even knows about Japan. It's just kind of sitting there. And so what they have to do in order to create unity is a little bit more difficult than what was happening in Europe. Um, they are going to create the cre continue all the feudal traditions. Like, there's still daimyo, there's still samurai, all that kind of stuff. Um, but this shogun officially controlled all of the daimyo. During this time period, there's about 260 daimyo in Japan, and each daimyo had their own governments and their own militaries. So that's like a governor. But the Tokugawa shogun is going to have the largest military, and he's going to have the largest amount of, of land. Um, and eventually, once the daimyo start to import um, guns, uh, gunpowder weapons from the Europeans, we're going to see a huge change in Japanese government. So here's just kind of a graphic that gives you an idea. So you have the Tokugawa Shogun, who also happens to be the daimyo of Edo, Kyoto, Osaka, and Nagasaki. These four areas are really important. Edo and Kyoto have both served as capital cities for the, ja for the Japanese islands throughout history. So they control the two main capital cities cities. Osaka and Nagasaki are major port cities. So as the Japanese start to trade with the Europeans as exploration happens and through the 16, you know, those two centuries, 1600 to 1800, the Japanese are going to import more and more, more things. Osaka and Nagasaki are those port cities. So here, this Tokugawa shogun controls two traditional capital cities plus two port cities. So you can imagine um, the power that that gives him. And then, of course, he had his own samurai, and then he also had a council of elders for advisors. Then you have your daimyo. There were 260 Hans. Hans is basically just a province, like we call a state, right? Um, and each one of those daimyo would have a council of elders, and each one of the daimyos would have their own samurai. However, um, eventually, there's too many samurai. So the samurai are going to have to find other jobs. And a lot of what they did was they started to become scholar bureaucrats. Now remember that the Japanese had imported that bureaucratic system and somewhat of those, not necessarily the exam system, but those ideas are, um, have been imported in Japan from many, many centuries ago. And so the idea of having an educated bureaucrat becomes important to these daimyos. So a lot of the samurai give up that samurai lifestyle and become government workers, basically. The other option for a samurai is to become a ronin, and a ronin is basically a lordless samurai. They don't have anyone providing for them in regards to food or shelter or anything else. And those ronin are actually going to become a problem. Um, there's been some movies out recently about it, but basically the ronin are going to um, rebel against the the system because they don't have a leader they don't have any loyalty to anyone but the idea of the samurai or the idea of that culture so there is an actual um ronin revolt which is put down pretty quickly now one of the biggest problems that the shogun's going to have is controlling these 260 daimyos these daimyos just like in europe were in charge for these were families that were in charge for centuries and centuries and centuries they're royalty and so how does a shogun control these old elites how does a shogun create unity amongst them well one of the things that he does is he creates what's called sankin kotai and sankin kotai is where the daimyo is required to live in the capital city with the shogun for a certain amount of time each year now there's several reasons for this this is what Louis XIV does with Versailles, and this is what Peter the Great does with St. Petersburg as well. What it does is it pulls the lords away from their samurai. So therefore, the samurai are going to lose their loyalty to that individual daimyo. Um, it also forces the daimyo to spend a lot of their wealth on maintaining two households. So they have to maintain their household in their province, but they also have to maintain 
and keep a royal look about them in the capital city as well. And that's really expensive. Louis XIV does this with Versailles. Peter the Great does this with um, St. Petersburg. It's the same idea. So what the shogun is doing is he's forcing them to spend their time and money, which is what gives someone power, um, on maintaining loyalty to him. This is a really smart way to control the nobility. And the nobility don't even really realize what's happening. And so the samurai become less loyal to the individual daimyo and more loyal to like this idea of a state daimyo, this idea of like a kingship. Um, the shoguns start to do things like controlling marriages as well. These marriage alliances are really important to the daimyos and to their holding of their land and controlling their land. Henry VIII does this as well on a large scale and so does Louis XIV. Um, the marrying certain families to other families is really important in regards to power and so the daimyo were being weakened by some of these marriage alliances that the shogun was making for them and so eventually the shogun is so powerful that the daimyo are having to ask the shogun for basic permissions to do basic things like travel or anything and so the daimyo have just slowly over the two centuries um, that the, the Tokugawa are in, are in charge have just lost power and they didn't even necessarily realize it and that's the key to some of these monarchs in this time period all over the world is that they manage to control these old nobles and the nobles don't even realize it's happening they don't even notice that it's really happening um, and you know they, they kind of wake up a couple of centuries later and it's like hey what happened to our power now we have this central government and um like I said, Louis the Fourteenth was fantastic at it, and so was Henry the Eighth. So, on, at the beginning of the Tokugawa, here is the social system: you have the imperial court and the shogun. Remember, through this whole thing, you still have an emperor hanging out at um, the capital city, not really doing anything but being an emperor. Then you have your warriors and your administrators, so in this case your samurai, right? And then your scholar bureaucrats, part of the bureaucracy, who's ever working for the shogun. Underneath them you have your peasants and your artisans. 80% of the population of Japan was made up by peasants and artisans. Notice merchants, okay? Confucianism will never support merchants. Part of the reason for that is the idea of Confucianism is that everybody does everything for the good of everybody else. It's a kind of communist in that idea. Well, to be a merchant, you have to get profit, and so therefore you're taking advantage of other people. So merchants were not necessarily well praised in Confucianism, and they're not going to be praised in this Japanese system either. And again, like I said, as the 1600s into the 1800s, as we get in through these two centuries, we see a massive change for Japan because the merchants, because they're opening up trade. and. As the Japanese trade more and more, obviously merchants become more acceptable to their society. So we have a huge change. Um, the Confucian ranking is basically the as the shogun moves the daimyo and the samurai into government positions instead of into um, inherited positions. So basically, he puts the daimyo on the government paycheck. So instead of um, you know being in charge of his own province, the daimyo is now getting money and pay from the government, and so the loyalty has shifted, um, which of course will impact the samurai caste on a large scale. So the people who are affected the most by this are going to be the samurai. Um, and as a result, the government has to create like an army, a professional military. And one thing that they're going to do in order to train this professional military is that they have to get rid of some of the samurai traditions the sword fighting and all of that kind of stuff and they have to teach everyone how to use gunpowder weapons well luckily for them we had a bunch of civil war veterans who needed jobs so we have a huge amount of our civil war veterans american civil war veterans who go to japan to teach these japanese guys how to fire these guns and as a result the japanese are going to develop this massive military and you know then world war ii happens one of the biggest problems is that the daimyo um, are having issues with maintaining their basic their basic needs and they end up in this massive debt to the rice merchants and obviously as a result of that now the rice merchants have power over the daimyo so the daimyo are just 
basically completely wiped out at this point. Um, the merchants become super wealthy and they become higher. And this, this is basically the same thing that happens in Europe as well. So after Confucianism no longer matters and it's all about gunpowder weapons, it's about becoming an imperial power, it's about changing Japan and modernizing it, we have a new system. You have the imperial court, the emperor is still around, and you have a shogun. Um, you have your professional military guys, you have your bureaucrats still, but you see a huge shift here where peasants and farmers and all that kind of stuff are going to be on the bottom, where merchants are now more powerful and more important. This Again, this change is something that we see also in Europe throughout this time period. Economic growth. Um, they get some new crops, they get that champa rice, um, and they develop new irrigation systems and they, and they start using fertilizers. Um, these technologies come in out of the interaction with the Europeans, and as a result of that, the Japanese are going to increase their population, which of course is one of the reasons why the government is going to change so much, and why the social classes are going to change so much. Um, they go from, they start, they start producing things for profit, like cotton, believe it or not, Japan has a huge cotton industry, um, sake, silk, and indigo. Those four products are going to be really important to Japanese um, trade. Obviously, the Japanese have figured out other things to trade. Between 1600 and 1700, agricultural production doubled, and that in and of itself is why the government changed, why the social classes changed. Um, Japan moved very quickly. And something that took the Europeans, you know, from the fall of Rome all the way up until the 1500s, you know, over a thousand years to develop, the Japanese did in about 200 years. Population growth, it increased by a third. Um, most of the families are going to maintain, are going to um, stick to their same standard of living. There's not like a huge amount of poverty. To, a lot of times when you have an increase in a population this quickly, you have an increase in poverty because there's a lack of resources. Not everybody's getting access to the same resources. It's really not the case for Japan. Um, the Japanese lifestyle is very simple. Uh, Rice-based diet, um, you know, their clothing is pretty simple. And so there's not really this huge necessarily increase in poverty during this time period. How did they, one of the reasons why they are going to um, control their population is because they're an island. Um, they they don't have room to expand. The only if they want more Japanese people in the world, they got to go conquer something. Um, so that's something that they're not necessarily interested in doing. So the Japanese were careful about their population growth, where it's very different from what we saw elsewhere. Now, one of the reasons why Europe doesn't have this massive population growth is because of the plague. Um, but Japan doesn't have any of those natural, they don't have war, they don't really have disease that comes onto the islands and destroys their population, so they had to, they controlled their populations themselves. Um, the Japanese have a tendency to marry later, which means less babies. Um, they did perform quite a bit of abortion um, and infanticide, um, and they did have forms of contraception. I'm not really sure exactly what those were, but they did control their population. So instead of where Europe is having like, you know, European families are having five, six kids, in Japan they're having one or two. So they're just not expanding as quickly as other areas are. Um, some cities did hit a million people by the 18th century. Um, and so Japan does have a large amount of a population in regards to urban centers. But again, their rural areas are few and far between and there's not a lot of population out in the rural areas. This is the exact opposite of China. Foreigners. Uh, the Japanese are xenophobic, which means fear of foreigners. They don't like other people in their land. Um, and they actually issued, a lot of the Tokugawa shoguns issued edicts to keep control of the foreigners. The Japanese were not allowed off the island. The Japanese were not allowed to travel. The Japanese didn't do any exploration or anything like what the Europeans or the Chinese or anybody else was doing. Um, they're not even allowed to build very large ships. Um, they're not building the junk. They're not building caravels. They're not going anywhere. Um, Europeans were not allowed in Japan at all. And you weren't allowed to import foreign books. Part of that is because of... Um, they didn't want to change the culture. The Japanese, the Japanese government was very stable. They didn't want cultural changes um, in Japan. They didn't want the daimyo to realize what had happened to them either. Um, 
in fact, there's a couple instances where the Portuguese, the Portuguese went to Japan first and they actually tried to train them, but they were executed. Um, the only people that were allowed in Japan and that the Japanese were really willing to interact with were the Chinese. Neo-Confucianism comes in um, because formal education for those bureaucrats and for the aristocrats and for the upper class was basically in Chinese and so they had to use the Confucian text to teach their own people. Um, and the neo -Confu new Confucianism, neo means new, um, really justified the shogun system. The idea of a, a father-like king figure who runs the show for everybody and everybody's working together for the good of everybody else. A lot of people, some Japanese didn't like neo-Confucianism and in order to control the culture of Japan, the shoguns actually started promoting what's called native learning. And native learning basically is going to go back to folk traditions. They're going to try to uh, revitalize Shinto, um, get rid of a lot of the Chinese influence that had happened in Japan. And so there was a change in education as we went through these 200 years that the Tokugawa were in charge. Um, as far as culture goes, the merchants obviously are going to live in the cities. We have major urban centers in Japan, um, and they created these cultural um, worlds called floating worlds or ukiyo. Um, and these ukiyo uh, celebrated, like I said, what the government was doing um, was trying to kind of revitalize native Japanese culture, and so they did that through these flor floating worlds. Um, some of the examples of these floating worlds are things like the tea house. The tea house would have, um, the tea house was a, the tea house was a social gathering place for men, um, and men would go here to be entertained, um, literally entertained, like not like, um, like in a sexual way at all, they would, the geisha were these entertainers, geisha are not prostitutes, geisha were women who, usually peasant women, who actually managed to gain some type of education in regards to business, um, dance, singing, things of that nature, and they would entertain these gentlemen in these tea houses. And to be a successful geisha, like you wanted to, um, you know, gain the favor of a couple major clients. And a lot of these, this is actually a huge freedom for some of the women in Japan. Uh, Japan is very patriarchal, but these geisha women actually were running their own businesses. Um, at eventually, however, some of the clients would request sexual um, favors. And so some geisha were, um, would kind of delve into that prostitute er area. Um, however, these geisha had to go get health exams every six months, um, which kept the transition of sexually transmitted diseases and things like that very low for this world for the, for the Japanese. Um, the geisha also would limit the men that they would actually, you know, have sexual relationships with. And the men were very protective over the geishas that they would choose. So over her lifetime, a geisha would have very few actual sexual partners. Um, the marriages amongst the aristocrats were because of political reasons or money reasons. And so you had these loveless marriages. Um, and then these men would actually develop these relationships with these geishas. So many of the geisha actually were, um, a lot of men would get, would fund a, one of their geisha's entire lifestyle. Like they would get her an apartment, they would provide her clothing, all of her health care, everything else. That's another reason why the population is going to be controlled is that most of these geishas, if they, if and when they did get pregnant, they would abort that baby um, because you could not mess with the bloodlines of the aristocrats. So, but these, the idea of a geisha, the idea of a mistress, these were professional courtesans, um, but they were very well trained in the arts of dancing and singing and instruments and all of that. Um, the geisha, one of the reasons why geisha get the reputation of being prostitutes is that after World War II, during the American occupation of Japan, a lot of the women started to call themselves geisha, um, and those women were the ones that were in the relationships with the American servicemen, the prostitution um, 
increases like crazy when the American servicemen are occupying Japan. Um, and these women are going to use this geisha term to, um, you know, sound um, foreign and, um, you know, these servicemen kind of went right, it played into it. And so that geisha term got uh, changed throughout history where a geisha in the beginning of Japanese culture was just a female entertainer um, who was actually very well educated and a businesswoman and very free um, socially where versus the prostitution that developed after World War II with the geisha. So please keep those things in mind. Um, you did have prostitution obviously in the cities. You can't have a city without a brothel. Um, However, the Japanese develop, um, did develop two forms of theater. You have your kabuki theater. Kabuki theater is basically just a play. Um, the reason why it's unique is because a lot of the kabuki plays were based off of the mythology of the Japanese creation myths and things like that. Um, the Japanese are very, Shinto is very nature based. And so a lot of their theater are going to be based off of changings of seasons or, you know, plays, plays like that. They did have some comedies. Um, Kabuki theater was a very, um, the only men were allowed to be actors. And so it was actually a very safe place for homosexuals to um, live out their lives in Japan because they would play the fe the feminine, the female roles. Um, so believe it, despite Japan, like Japan does have these social intricacies that allows the different groups of people to actually have safe havens within their culture, um, which is something that's unique to Japan. They also did these marionette, like a Pinocchio type of plays called Benruku Bunraka and they basically were these puppet plays that were um, uh, it was an art form and the puppets were the, if you became a successful puppet maker um, you would become very rich within Japan. The Woodblock prints I'll, I'll show you one in just a second and then of course haiku poetry which hopefully you guys are familiar with. Here's an example of a woodblock print. The reason why woodblock prints are so important is that they're unique in regards to the way that they're made. So each one of those colors that's on this print was carved into a piece of wood. Um, but this is difficult to explain, but if you take a piece of wood and you, you're looking at a stamp, the part that is raised is what, this, what becomes the stamp. So every single block would have to have, basically the artist was carving what he didn't want to be in the picture. So all of the green would be on one block or all of the, you know, the, um, the black would be in one block. And so they would have to take these different blocks to create stamps out of them to create this piece of work. And that's something that's very intricate and very difficult to do. Um, they most of your woodblock prints are going to be nature scenes because of Shinto um, and obviously a lot of the mountains like Mount Fuji and things like that are going to be um, presented. One of the cool parts about Japanese woodblock prints is that you can actually trace ownership. One of the things that the Japanese did was you would have a red stamp, it was like your seal, um, your family seal, and anytime a piece of art exchanged hands, they would put a new seal on it so you can see where the painting went. Uh, one thing that's a little bit different about, about Japanese art and these woodblock prints is that they were actually kind of mass produced. So because they were stamps, they were they were wood blocks and so they could they could produce many of these. Um, the Kummer Museum actually has a whole series of wood block prints um, so you can actually go look at them. They are, the Kummer is free on Tuesdays and you can go see the red seals of the family ownership and things like that. As far as Christianity in Japan goes, um, like we saw in China where it was kind of welcomed at first and then kicked out, um, the missionary that goes into Japan, his name is Francis the Savior. The missionary that went into China was Matteo Ricci. The daimyo, um, if a daimyo converted, they would force their subjects to convert. So here's some numbers. By 1650, we have about 300,000 Christians, which is not a lot for the Japanese population. Um, but the emperor started a, not the emperor, the shogun started an anti-Christian campaign and executed anybody who was Christian. So Christianity does not show up in Japan. It's not a thing in Japan at all. Eventually, once we get into 
more of the 1700s, 1800s, the Japanese shoguns decide that maybe the Europeans have some stuff that they want. So they allowed the Dutch, and only the Dutch, to trade in Nagasaki. Um, this is a picture of modern Nagasaki. Yes, Nagasaki is one of the places that we blew up with the atomic bomb. Um, the Dutch taught medicine, science, and astronomy, and what the Japanese realized was that some of the stuff that the Chinese were, that they had learned from the Chinese, especially in regards to things like medicine and science, were completely wrong. So for all of their greatness that China was, up until the Tang and the Song, all of a sudden their learning and their medicine and everything else just kind of stopped. Um, the Europeans surpassed them, and the Japanese realized this, and the Japanese needed to get access to that information, and so they are importing all of these books and these um, ideas from the scientific revolution, the um, reformation, the enlightenment, and all of that stuff was coming flooding into Japan, but the shoguns were controlling who was reading it and who was allowed to read it. And as a result of that, Japan is going to surpass China in power, obviously in the modern day. Um, Japan is going to modernize very quickly. They're going to take advantage of the scientific revolution that the Europeans were doing. And Japan is going to kind of show up during World War One, and all of a sudden everybody's like, where did you come from? And we have to pay attention to Japan. Uh, and in fact, the United States was one of the only countries that was really, hey, we need to watch this random island that came out of nowhere. Um, and that will ultimately lead to World War II. Um, the only thing that was not allowed into Japan was anything about Christianity. And they were, so today even, the Japanese are very um, atheist in their religious beliefs. They do have Shinto, but um, there's not a lot of um, organized religion in the country today at all. So we will continue on with Japan. In the next period, we'll talk about Japan and how they become a huge military powerhouse in the um, 1900s, how they are forced to be reckoned with through World War I. Um, the Japanese are going to try to take out China, and they're actually kind of successful. The Japanese are going to be successful at taking out Russia. And again, this little sleepy island that's been doing nothing up until this time period all of a sudden shows up and becomes this huge foreign power and um, so in the next unit the next two units we're going to see a lot from Japan um, and they're really smart about what they do and it's quite amazing what they manage to do so we'll see a lot more from Japan in the next two time periods thanks for listening